we all know that the explosion that destroyed Reactor 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant began at around or just before 1.23.45 a.m. on April 26th, 1986. These explosions threw up the upper biological shield and then caused the complete collapse of the northern face of the building, killing Valery Hodomchuk. But what if I told you that there was another explosion that may have been as powerful as the first, and yet it has been completely forgotten? You may not believe it, and yet the evidence is there. So, let's explore the forgotten Chernobyl explosion. There are three key pieces of evidence that confirm this explosion took place. The first of these is from the information provided by the operators in the control room. Per regulations, they had to record everything in the operating log. At the time, 1.39.16, the operators wrote reactor explosion in the log entry. This is unique from their logs about the main explosion, which were recorded at an unknown time, but to specify the explosion occurred around 10 past 1 in the morning. There's a lot of disagreement over the exact timing of things that night, so we'll take it with a grain of salt on the preciseness of it. What it does show is that sometime after the explosion that tore the building apart, there was another explosion that occurred, but nothing else can be ascertained about where or how large it was. The second piece of evidence answers the question of where the explosion came from, potentially. That is, of course, the surviving data from the Scala computer, which records all signals from the reactor block. Despite being knocked out temporarily during the explosion, it was back and working soon after, allowing it to capture the last signals of Unit 4. This is what the DREG program of the Scala computer recorded. For context, BS means the steam separator drums. 139.29. A signal appears. Decrease of level in the SUZ emergency tank. And pressure in BS premises over 500 kilograms per square meter. 140.01. A signal appeared. Increased pressure in airtight compartments. Those to the right closer to the SAOR, over 500 kilograms per square meter. 140.04, the signal disappeared. 140.24, signal appeared again. Increased pressure in airtight compartments, those bright, closer to the SAOR, over 500 kilograms per square meter. 140.39, pressure in BS right, fell from 40 to 22 atmospheres. Pressure of BS left was not registered. 140.36 Level of water in BS left, plus 750 millimetres. 140.49 Signal disappeared. Increased pressure in airtight compartments. Those to the right, closer to SAOR, over 500 kilograms per square metre. 140.49 A signal appeared. Decrease of pressure in the SUZ pressure collector. What the computer data tells us is that around 1.40am, an explosion occurred in the vicinity of airtight compartments, if not within them. Within them is more likely, given the pressure increase registered just before. Let's keep in mind where this pressure increase is, in the airtight compartments. We'll come back to this as it may give us a clue as to what events are unfolding. The third and final piece of evidence comes from seismic data recorded at the stations around the nuclear power plant. In general, it is rare to find this information. However, there are a couple of pieces that give us details. The first is Nikolai Karpan's debunk of the theory that an earthquake caused the Chernobyl explosion, because that's a thing. As an appendix, he provides the seismic data at the Norinsk site, showing the explosion we're all familiar with. But 
because it's a seismic station, that data keeps going beyond that time. Now we turn to a report by the All Union Research Institute for Nuclear Power Plant Operation, VNIIAES. This paper documents all the seismic data on April 25th and 26th, and shows that significant seismic pulses were recorded at 1.39.08 and 1.39.11 in the morning at Chernobyl. As we know, five seconds later, the operators will report an explosion inside the building. It appears that, in fact, it may have been two. So, to summarise, the operators experienced an explosion at 1.39am, which was recorded in seismic data, confirming its existence. The explosion was likely associated with pressure changes in airtight compartments and the steam separator drums. Suppose it exists, the next logical question is where did it come from? There is one more thing worth mentioning, something circumstantial to the discussion, which may also help clue us into what was actually unfolding around that time, or it could just be a red herring. This comes from the silly mole, an electrician on site that night. In an interview with Alexander Kupny on his YouTube channel, with a translation provided by Roman Belusov, which I have also double-checked to make this absolutely clear, Moll says this. At 6am, I was already trying to prove to the KGB that the first explosion was not in the reactor. Also, to there having been two explosions. The first, a rupture of the circulation pumps and a second one above me. Years later, the commission from Moscow found me and told me that I was right. They drilled where I told them, and it turned out that the coolant pump number one went off. Mole seems to be indicating that something went boom around 208 stroke 9, the compartment of main circulation pump 1 of unit 4. However, the damage assessment of that room today is that there is no damage. We'll leave it at that for now. In 1986, as part of their report to the Vienna meeting of 1986, in 1986, as part of their report to the Vienna meeting, the Soviets attempted to bury their cover-up of the causes of the accident by burying them under piles of information about the operation of the RBMK. Unintentionally, this has made the report one of the most English accessible insights into the systems and features of the pre-Chernobyl RBMK. Perhaps if we look in here, we may find clues about the function of these airtight compartments. As it turns out, there is exactly one mention of airtight compartments in the entire report, and it refers to a localising safety system. Let's take a quick glance. It localises discharges including radiation when an accident occurs, which seems to be... which seems to fit the bill of the Chernobyl disaster just fine. But it is the section, in another part of it, about the safety systems that piqued my interest. During normal operation of the block, hydrogen can enter SLA compartments with coolant leaks with a magnitude of 2 tonnes per hour and with possible steam leaks through closed safety valves. Hydrogen can also enter under conditions of short-term discharge of steam, when the GPK triggers and under piping rupture conditions. The largest amount of hydrogen can enter the compartments under MPA conditions, hydrogen which is accumulated in the coolant and also formed during the accident due to radiolysis and reaction of zirconium with water. The total influx of hydrogen under these conditions is shown in figure 2.50. With the existing standard of the lower limit of hydrogen explosibility in air, 4% by volume, 0.2% by volume was adopted in the design as the reference value. To maintain this concentration under least favourable conditions, 800 cubic metres of air per hour 
must be exhausted from the SLA compartments. This flow rate was also adopted for all other operating conditions of the block. The SUV includes the following, electric heater, contact apparatus, condenser, moisture separator, circulator. The graph showing the influx of hydrogen, figure 2.50, was also presented. There are several compartments that we must sift through. Unfortunately, the diagram provided of the system is vague at best. I can only really see the steam suppression pools and maybe where the sub-reactor room is, which, as we know, was likely destroyed in the explosion, thus becoming not very airtight, but everything else seems at least somewhat out of scale. After doing some more digging, I found another diagram of the same system from the Obninsk Institute of Atomic Energy, part of the Moscow Engineering Physics Institute, which is just a bit easier to read. The design is very human. Anyway, the diagram also clarifies our mystery airtight compartments, which, according to the site, are consisting of the boxes for the main circulation pump tanks, shafts for the downcomers, the pipes allowing water to flow from the steam separators down to the main circulation pipes, and a steam discharge corridor. So, according to Scala, there were sudden pressure increases and decreases in at least one of these compartments. Now, I would like to propose a theory of what happened that night. Obviously, what I'm about to say cannot properly be verified. However, it does fit with the evidence best. It's no secret that I am a staunch believer that the second explosion had nothing to do with hydrogen, to quite a bit of controversy. It's my opinion that the damage caused by the explosion just doesn't line up with the hydrogen theory. Something that expedition workers who have ventured into the ruins, such as Konstantin Chechorov, agree with. In the video, I go over how there just isn't enough time to produce adequate amounts of hydrogen to produce such a large explosion. However, we're not giving the reactor just a couple of seconds to produce the monumental amounts of hydrogen gas now, but roughly 16 minutes. The hydrogen is then directed into the airtight boxes. Presumably, the hydraulic shocks in the water circuit flowing through the reactor would cause the pipes to shatter in numerous places, such as around MCP-1 like Moll claimed, and around the downcomer piping. Steam and hydrogen, superheated to temperatures as high as 10,000 degrees Celsius, would then accumulate in these areas, as it was designed to do so, but at a much lower pressure than in the core, allowing for the splitting of water and oxygen to occur at a much faster rate, further supplemented by radiolysis, given how radioactive the steam would have been at that time. With the complete destruction of the reactor, the graph the Soviets produced of hydrogen production goes completely out the window. Hydrogen would be produced much faster. Normally this would be removed, but with the destruction of the building's electrical circuits, combined with flooding, most electrical systems are not working, cannot keep up with the amount of hydrogen being produced. And then, just after 1.39am, the hydrogen ignited. The most likely candidate location would be the northern downrunner compartment, room 404 stroke 4. This is the right side of the RBMK, where the Scala messages were recorded, showing rapid pressure increases, and then the loss of pressure in the steam separator drums directly above them. The room is unique for a different reason, in that according to the floor plans of the sarcophagus, the ceiling of the room 404 stroke 4 collapsed downwards, as if a loss of structural integrity occurred. This wasn't seen on the other side of the building, 
where the room is largely intact, aside from the collapsed railings on some of the service balconies. The discrepancies in timing for the computer data can be explained by disruption due to the explosion. The explosion damage, while significant, is largely contained to the room. It is surrounded by very thick concrete walls to the south, west and east, and north, and there isn't anything north of the room to be destroyed. However, the seismic significance of the explosion could not be similarly absorbed. The workers in the control room felt it, and the seismographs nearby recorded a spike comparable to the initial explosion before the destruction of the building. Powerful, but not significant compared to the second explosion that destroyed the building. Again, all of this is just a theory, but it fits the facts quite well, in my opinion. Regardless of your thoughts on the matter, I'm sure some people will have come to completely different conclusions from the same evidence. It should serve as a lesson to all of you who have watched the video. We know a lot about the last hours of Chernobyl Reactor 4, down to the millisecond in some cases. But everything inside the reactor, after maybe 1.23.42 in the morning, remains an enduring mystery. We must endeavour to continue to illuminate these oddities, and piece together the true story of the Chernobyl disaster, however deep the information lies buried.